Amen. As we enter into a time of hearing God's message this morning, let me invite you to still your hearts and bow your heads and let's go to the Lord in prayer together. God, we give you thanks. This is a day of new beginnings for so many in our community and for so many in our church, for the children and the teenagers who are going back to school, for the young adults who are going back to start the fall semester at college, for parents who are entrusting their children, for teachers, for principals and administrators and school staff. This is uh, such a day of new beginnings for so many, and we pray that it would be a rich and a fruitful time of learning and of formation. I pray especially for children in our schools this coming week who may not entirely be looking forward to the new school year with joy. For those who are beset by uncertainty or by anxiety, even by fear. For those children who don't have many friends, if at all, in the hallways of their schools. For kids who are going into a school for the first time, perhaps having just moved to Springdale or somewhere in northwest Arkansas this summer. For those who have social anxieties and for those who have learning disabilities. For all those who have special challenges, we pray a special blessing, asking that you would anoint them by your Holy Spirit. And I pray also for the children of this church, that they would look upon all of those whom I've just named with compassion and care, that their hearts would be enlarged towards them, that they would seek to follow Jesus in the cafeteria and on the playground, in the hallways and in the classroom that they would care for the least, the last, and the lost, even in their own schools, that they would be as Jesus to those children who have not as much or who fear or who are intimidated. Let the kids from this church shine the light of Jesus in all of our schools, Lord. Let them show love, let them show compassion, and let them show care in all things. And now, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would center our hearts and our minds on the message that you would have us to receive this day. Let us be open to your word and to your Holy Spirit, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen. I need a fresh start. That is what the, the young left-handed pitcher said to the reporter who stuck the microphone in front of his face after just telling him that he had been traded from the ball club that he had been with since he was drafted into the minor leagues to one across the country. I need a fresh start. This was a talented left-hander, stood a full six foot five, had a screaming fastball, had been drafted in one of the early rounds after only his sophomore year in college. His minor league season had started off great. After his first year, he had even been selected to pitch for the U.S. national team. Everything was going the way that he hoped that it would go until all of a sudden it wasn't. The 2020 season came and COVID wiped out the minor league baseball season. Later that year, he was injured. Then he was injured again and then he needed a Tommy John surgery. Recovering from that, he was injured yet again and ended up missing the entire 2021 season and then all of a sudden standing outside of the baseball facility with that microphone in his face and a reporter waiting for his answer he should have been demoralized the ball club that had invested so much in his development all of a sudden was ready to cast him off but he refused to see it as a defeat he looked resolutely into the eyes of that reporter and he said, I just need a fresh start. We've all been there, haven't we? At some point in our lives, we have reached a season. By its very nature, it's never a season that we seek out ourselves. It's a season, rather, that is thrust upon us and we feel like we need a fresh start. Maybe it's a job that 
seemed great until all of a sudden it went south on you. Maybe for some of the kids out there, it's a semester in school where they just didn't make the grades that they thought they were going to make. Perhaps it was a relationship that itself was going really well until all of a sudden it wasn't. That desire for a fresh start, the desire to start over again in a new way. If you've lived long enough, it is an experience that is as universal in human life as any. I wanted to talk about that a little bit today because of the time of year it is. This is, as we said earlier in the service, this is what we call Back to School Sunday. I think of it almost as like a second New Year's Day. There is the actual New Year's Day, and that's a time when we seek a fresh start too, isn't it? It's a time when we look forward to the new year, making New Year's resolutions, saying, this is the year I'm going to form that habit I've always needed to form. This is the year I'm going to overcome this obstacle in my life that I've been trying to overcome for years now. Well, for so many in our community, today is kind of like that. I mean, this is back to school Sunday. You're starting a new year tomorrow. I was talking to a teacher in my own neighborhood just yesterday, and she was saying that. She said, you know, Andrew, it feels like every year this week I get ready and have the opportunity for a fresh start. There are children in elementary school, teenagers in high school. There are young adults in college who are looking for that fresh start. I was scrolling through Facebook yesterday afternoon, and there's a lot of mamas, a lot of mamas in this church who put on Facebook the picture of their son or daughter sitting on a dorm room bed just down the road in Fayetteville, and they all said, I left just a little bit of my heart on the hill this afternoon, right? as my son or my daughter was starting their freshman year. Sometimes it's a fresh start for a kid. Sometimes it's a fresh start for that kid's parents. Well, if we're thinking about that at at this time of the year, and if we're thinking about what it means to have a fresh start in our conventional lives, I think we would do well to think about what that means for our spiritual lives as well. As a matter of fact, This is a great time of the year with so much coming up in the life of our church when we can ask that question about our discipleship. We can ask that question about our faith or about our relationship with Jesus. How can this be a time when we have hopes and dreams not only in our conventional day-to-day life but in our faith life? How can this be a time of year when we have a fresh start not just in our workaday lives but in what it means for us to follow Jesus. The man in the story from the Gospel of Luke this morning, he's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, described in slightly different ways. In one of the Gospels, he's called a rich young man. In this one, he's called a certain ruler. We usually put those descriptions together and we call him the rich young ruler. In all of the ways that the Gospels describe him, he's somebody who seems like he's got his life together. He's wealthy. He is a ruler, meaning that he is a layman of prominence in his local synagogue. He's a person of stature, a person of reputation. He's a person of influence in the town where he lives. He seems like he's got everything going for him, but we know that in some way, he simply doesn't because he's seeking Jesus out. He has reached a season in his life when in some way or another, he needs a fresh start. And so he comes to Jesus for answers. And the question that he asks of Jesus is this. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now the very way that he poses that question is a way that a college student might say to his professor. You go to someone, someone that doesn't know goes to someone who does. Someone who's an authority. Someone who can give him the right answer. Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus, for his sake, sizes the man up pretty quickly. As a matter of fact, he has this guy pegged from the very first sentence that comes out of his mouth. Read it again. What must I do to inherit? Do you see anything wrong with that? When you're in line to inherit something, 
Do you have to do anything for that? You do things in order to achieve things, or you do things in order to earn things. I do my job so that I can earn my salary, right? I do laps at the pool so that I can improve my time in the backstroke. But if I'm going to inherit something, I don't have to do anything. I simply have to have a certain identity, don't I? And the identity that I have to have is as a son or a daughter, you see. And so what Jesus recognizes from the very first is that the man is confused. He thinks that he has to do something in order to inherit. But what you have to have in order to inherit is simply to be in a family where there is an inheritance due. And so what Jesus tries to do is he tries to draw the man in. He realizes that this is the kind of guy who's got a really strong work ethic. This is the kind of guy who, who really likes to cross the bar, who really likes to achieve things. And so he goes and begins to ask him the types of questions that one would ask if you run into a person of that sort. And what he asks him is this. He says, You've read the commandments, haven't you? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. Those are the types of questions that a can-do type A personality loves to get asked. Because he's been checking boxes his entire life. And when he gets asked those questions, you have to imagine that he smiles to himself, a little bit smug, and he thinks, oh, well, this isn't going to be that difficult after all. If this is the only test that I've got to pass, well, then I'm going to tell Jesus I've been doing it, and he's going to tell me I'm already there. And so he says to him, teacher, all of these things I've been doing since the time of my youth. And Jesus looks at him. And he helps him to realize that perhaps the test isn't easy, that easy after all. Because you see, what Jesus has been asking him is the Ten Commandments. But he conspicuously and most likely intentionally skipped over one of them. The first one. And the first commandment is the commandment that goes this way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the, la the land of slavery, out of the house of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. So Jesus, having run through all of those other commandments and having drawn that rich young ruler in, well, then he circles back around to the first one. And what he does is he asks the young man if he is willing to embrace all that God desires for his life. And the way that he does it is he asks the young man if he's ready to put down his idol. The way that he asks the question is this. One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and give the money to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Now, we don't know the entirety of how the young man reacted to that. Like a lot of stories in the Gospels, we get the teaching from Jesus. We get the punchline from Jesus. And then the Gospel very quickly moves on to the next story. What we do know is that the man didn't accept it on its face. It says that he was deeply grieved, for he had many possessions. And so we know that Jesus, in asking that question about idols, asking that question about what is it that you have that you place before the God of Israel? What gods have you set up before or between you and him that he's put his finger on something very sensitive in this young man's life? And we see what it was, his wealth, his money. 
And we're tempted to think, oh my gosh, Jesus hates money, and this is a problem for us. Now, there are places in the world where it would not be a problem. Some of you have been to some of those places. There are places in the world where people aren't that tempted by their wealth because they don't have any wealth. We don't live in one of those places. Our society is, relatively speaking to other places in the world, very wealthy. We are the most affluent Christians who have ever lived. And so if the issue here is an issue that is solely about money, then we have some problems. Are we supposed to break all of our piggy banks and empty out our bank accounts and make ourselves destitute? And then, only then, can we follow Jesus? Well, if we look very carefully at what it is that Jesus is doing here, what we will discover is that it's not actually about money. Jesus doesn't hate money. Jesus hates idolatry. And what Jesus has done is he has recognized what the idol is in this particular young man's life. He was living a self-satisfied life where he had deluded himself into thinking that eternal life, into thinking that the kingdom of God is something that he had to earn, that there was something that he had to do in order to get it. Teacher, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? Was the question that he asked Jesus. He had come to believe that eternal life was like everything else in his life. That if he checked the right boxes and did the right sorts of things, that he could achieve it the same way one might achieve a high salary or a stock portfolio. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment that you are in the place of that young man. Most of you have done most of the things that you need to do in your life to set things up right. You have a good marriage. You've raised healthy children. You've planned for your retirement. But perhaps in your own life, you have come upon a season. Perhaps some of you are in that season right now where even though you've done everything right, somehow not everything is right. And let's imagine that you want to ask Jesus the question, what more is there? Please, Jesus, tell me that this is not all that there is. Please, Jesus, tell me. For God's sake, tell me that there is something more. Tell me that what I see around me is not the limit of what God wants for my life. And if there is something more, tell me how to get it. And now imagine that you are walking down a dusty roadway one day and you see him coming towards you and you look up and you realize that it's Jesus. And you realize that he's looking at you. And you ask him the question and he looks back at you with love in his eyes and he says, there is still yet one thing that you lack. And now ask yourself the question, what is that thing? What is the thing that you still lack? What is the thing that is keeping you from knowing God more in the same way that the wealthy young ruler's bank account was keeping him? What is the idol in your life? They come in many shapes and sizes. The one thing that we know for certain about idols is that they are always homemade. You don't go to Harps to pick up your idol. You can't order it at Walmart. Idols are made in our living rooms. They're made in our kitchens. They're made in our studies and in our bedrooms. Idols are always personal. We fashion them ourselves and then we set them up and we bow down to them and we worship them and they keep us from God. Jesus bids the young man to follow him. 
because he knew that that young man was following something else that was keeping him from knowing eternal life. He knew it because he could hear it in the question that the young man asked. He wasn't telling him what he had to do to inherit eternal life because Jesus knew that eternal life wasn't something that you had to do in order to receive. If you want to inherit eternal life, it's not a matter of what you do, but it's rather a matter of who you are. Children inherit. That's just the way that it works. And if you want to be in a place where you can inherit eternal life, you have to be counted among the children. You have to have the orphan spirit that you carry around with you banished forever. And you have to receive the spirit of adoption, you see. That's what we learn in Romans chapter 8. That there is a spirit of adoption that Jesus has brought into the world. And he wants to give you that spirit of adoption to banish the orphan spirit in your heart forever. The spirit that tells you that you're unlovable. That you're unwanted. That you deserve to be set adrift on the seas of the world and left alone to perish. That's not what God wants for you. Do you know why you feel that way? Do you know why every single one of us has felt that way in this room at some point in our lives? It's because the enemy. It's because Satan tells us that. And there is nothing that Satan wants more than for you to believe that God doesn't love you. Every one of you at some point in your lives has looked over the person next to you in church and said, he's got his stuff together so much better than I do. Or you've looked at the pew in front of you and you've said, I can see how she prays. She knows the Lord so much better than I do. And if I come to you and I say, no, God loves you too, you would say back to me, you don't know what I've done in my life. But here's the thing. I don't know what you've done in your life, but Jesus does, and he loves you anyway. Jesus tells us in John chapter 8 that whenever Satan speaks, he lies because it's all he knows how to do. Jesus calls him a liar and the father of lies, but Jesus never lies. He only speaks the truth. And he calls you to himself because he loves you. There is in our society a sickness of pandemic proportions. And it's not a virus. It's a spiritual sickness. I call it spiritual inferiority complex. And it is the complex that people has have, that people have that tells them that they are unlovable and that God could never want anything to do with them and that God could never call them to follow him. Well, I want to show you something that will demonstrate to you beyond a shadow of a doubt that that is not true. I didn't come up with this on my own. I read it a few years ago. I'm sure if you go home and you search for it online, you can find it yourself. But it is a listing of all of those people leading up to Jesus whose lives were a mess that God nevertheless figured out that he could work with. Look at this. Noah was a drunkard. Abraham was way too old. Jeremiah was way too young. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused by his brothers, and what it doesn't tell you is he was sold into slavery. His own family hated him. Moses was a murderer who couldn't get a single sentence out of his mouth straight. Rahab was a prostitute. But here, it goes on. Gideon was cowardly. Samson lacked integrity. David was an adulterer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran away from God, and John the Baptist ate bugs. You think you're really bad off? You're not that bad off. If on your lunch menu today is something 
a little more creative than locusts and wild honey, then you're not that bad off. God does love you. And he does want you. And he does want to call you to follow him. This is a season of fresh starts. Here in a little bit, you're going to start hearing about all the things that are going on in the life of this church this fall. Things that are going on in children's ministry and, and youth ministry. We're going to have things coming out about Bible studies that are going to be offered. About small groups that are forming in the life of the church. And all of those things are important. All of those things are vehicles. But they're just that. They're vehicles. They're not ends in themselves. And what they are vehicles for is for you to come to know the Lord better. I hope that when you begin to see all of those announcements or when you hear us call for you to consider all of those things, I hope that you really will. But here's what I hope that you will consider even before all of that. I hope that you'll consider that God wants to give you a fresh start. That God wants to call you anew in your life. That Jesus wants to love on you the same way that he was loving on that rich young ruler in Luke's gospel this morning. By telling you what you really need to hear. By giving you the opportunity to lay down that idol, whatever it might be. And by growing even closer to him and closer to him every day. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman at the well, a woman who had a checkered past, to say the least. He tells her, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He wants to banish your orphan spirit. He wants to call you his son and his daughter. He wants to give you eternal life. So let him, let him, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.